All right, today we're going over some common on-course scenarios to help you be a bit more comfortable when it comes time to getting out on the golf course. First thing we uh, encounter on the golf course is the tee box. And remember, we're gonna choose a tee that's appropriate to our skill level. Take a look at the scorecard, see how many yards each tee is playing. And uh, again, if you're a beginner, there's absolutely no shame in playing the furthest forward tee if not even teeing off for maybe the 200 yard marker out in the fairway. The goal is to play nine holes in two hours, so you gotta choose whatever tee box makes sure that that happens. We're gonna play ready golf unless we're in a very serious golf competition. That means we're not waiting to see whose turn it is based on the score on the previous hole. If you're ready to hit, go ahead and peg it and hit it down the fairway. We're gonna keep it moving. We don't need to be waiting for who had the lowest score on the last hole, figure that out. And let's just play ready golf unless you're in a very serious competitive event. A bit of advanced etiquette after you hit, especially on par threes, if you have a, a little tee fragment that you've created, a broken tee, pick up that broken tee and uh, either put it in your pocket or throw it away. And your uh, very golf savvy boss will appreciate that small detail. If you do happen to take a divot on a tee box, it's okay. Just make sure you get the sand bottle out fill it up and then smooth it with your foot. This just gives the grass a medium through which to regrow faster. If you don't fill your divot with sand, the ground's gonna be really uneven and it's gonna take forever for that grass to grow back. So if you take a divot, fill it up with some sand and smooth it over with your foot. All right, after we've hit our tee shots, hopefully we're headed to the fairway. When we're driving to the fairway, it's important that we abide by the cart rules of the day. The usually 90 degree rule is a good way to operate if you're not quite sure what the course conditions are that day. Usually if it's really wet, the starter's gonna tell you, hey, it's cart path only today. Please keep all four tires of the golf cart on the cart path at all times. But if it's pretty dry out there, abide by the 90 degree rule. Here's an example of how to do that. And if it's extremely dry, they might even tell you that uh, today we're gonna scatter on the golf carts. But uh, even then, it's best to minimize how much you're driving on the grass. When you find your ball out in the fairway, the golf courses provide either sprinkler heads with numbers on it or little plates on the ground to help you estimate how far you are from the hole. Usually those numbers are to the middle of the green and then there's a color-coded flag or some sort of system of showing you where the flag is on the green. So if you know where the pin is relative to the middle of the green, you can come up with a good estimate of your yardage to the hole. Some courses uh, even provide a GPS that you can use to uh, get a better look, a bird's eye view of the hole. You can usually press on the screen and it gives you yardages to uh, various parts of the course to help inform your club decision. Or you might even have a range finder, look through the viewer, press the button, it'll give you a number how far it is between you and your target. Even though your ball's in the fairway, it might come to rest up against a drain or a sprinkler head or some sort of obstruction out in the fairway, maybe the cart path. You are entitled to get relief from all of those obstructions. Just find your nearest point of full relief plus one club length no nearer the hole. And remember to drop that ball from your knee Used to be dropping from the shoulder, now we're dropping from the knee, and uh, that's free relief. You've probably seen people on TV pick up a little handful of grass clippings and throw it up in the air. What they're doing there is trying to get a sense of where the wind is blowing, because if that wind is in your face, it's gonna severely affect how far your golf ball flies, and opposite, if you're really far downwind, you might take one less or two less clubs to compensate for how much wind help there is. So pick up a little bit of grass, throw it up in the wind, see where the, uh, the ball's gonna be pushed. If you take a divot in the fairway, again, fill and smooth your divot. We're gonna take the sand bottle off of the golf cart, fill up the divot and smooth it over with our foot. That way the grass grows back nice and even. I played at a super fancy golf course in the desert in California where they actually wanted you to pick up all the divot fragments and put them in a bucket on the back of the cart. So double check what the uh, etiquette is at the golf course that you're playing. Some places don't want you to fill it up with sand. Uh, some people want you to try to replace the entire divot. It kind of depends on the grass. In most cases, if you're taking a divot on Bermuda grass, it's best just to fill it in with sand. But up in the north, if you're taking one of those nice big beaver pelts, put it back down on the ground. If you can get most of it intact and kind of stomp it back in there, 
Just depends on the type of grass. So maybe ask the pro before you tee off what to do with the divots. And after we've hit our shot in the fairway, we can drive up to a certain point where you're gonna see a sign that's directing the carts to return to the cart path. Usually that's about 50 yards from the green. They don't want the carts too close on the short cut grass. That's just gonna tramp down the grass and make it tougher for a wedge shot to get under that ball. So pay attention to where the cart signs are telling you to go back to the cart path. Definitely a noob move to get too close to the greens on the fairway. All right, hopefully we've hit our approach shot onto the green and it's time to fix our pitch marks. Here's an example of fixing a pitch mark. You can do this with a T or a ball mark repair tool. It's important to push in from the sides, pushing in, pushing in. We're never pulling up. That'll remove the roots from the ground. Push in towards the middle and then tap it down with your putter. Works out pretty well to keep it nice and smooth. Now that the rules have changed on the flagstick, a bit of advanced etiquette on the first hole might be, hey guys, how are we gonna play the flags today? Do you wanna just leave the flagstick in all day? Do you wanna pull it out all day? Do you want it to be situational? When I was caddying, that was one of the things that I would always do on the first tee and that just helped start the conversation about how we're gonna play fast today. How do we want that flagstick? If you are pulling the flagstick out, make sure you do so gently, especially if it's windy, if you just kinda Pull it out randomly. Sometimes the bottom of the flagstick will kick if it's real windy and damage the lip of the cup. So both hands, remove the flagstick and then gently lay it down on the fringe well out of the way of anybody else's putt. I played at a fancy golf course one time when I was younger when I just pulled the flagstick out and tossed it down on the ground and the member was like, <gasps> we lay the flagsticks down here. Don't do what I did, lay them down gently. Watch where you're walking on the greens especially around the hole, there's something called a through line. If you've got an ultra super duper persnickety golfer, he's gonna want a nice area past the hole in case he misses the putt. So even though you're not walking in the immediate line of his putt, you might be walking in what they call the through line, which is on the opposite side of the hole. If that putt happens to miss, you don't want a bunch of uh, foot marks or scuff marks on the grass there. So watch the, uh, the player's line of putting with your feet. Don't be dragging your feet, shuffling your feet, and uh, advanced etiquette, watch out for that through line. We talked about in our 201 short game class that we're gonna read the greens while other people are putting. It's definitely a noob move to be out of position in terms of I'm, I don't have my read yet and then I gotta read when it's my turn and it just takes too long. So read the greens while other people are putting. That way when it's your turn, you've already got the read, you can just step up and whack it. If your ball is in somebody else's way, remember to keep a ball marker, just like a small flat penny or something. You can put that right behind the ball and uh, mark your position. Sometimes if even the mark is in the other person's way, they'll ask you to move your mark so we're just gonna find a uh, position on the horizon and use that as a frame of reference as we use a club to mark either one or two club heads left or right. And just remember to put your mark back before you putt because it's a penalty if you don't. Generally for 90% of your rounds of golf, they're gonna give you a gimme in the leather. That's basically if you put the putter in the hole like this and stretch it out, if the ball is inside the grip, it's pretty common courtesy that that's a gimme. That just helps speed things up. We don't need to be marking two inch putts out there. It just takes forever. So if you hit it in the leather, it's okay to go ahead and rake your putt. Nobody's gonna fault you for that. And after everybody's done on the hole, again, two hands on that flag stick and gently put it back in the cup. Definitely a noob move to have it in one hand. It's waving with the wind and you jam it in the hole and you ding up the side of the cup. Carefully replace the flag stick. There's an etiquette on how to enter a bunker. If you happen to hit it in a bunker, don't walk in from the steep side. That's just gonna ruin the lip of the bunker and it's gonna take forever to rake it back up into place. Enter from a low position in the bunker where your footsteps aren't gonna destroy the lip and that'll save you a lot of time in re-raking the bunker. And we're trying to rake the bunker in such a way that the, the sand depth is consistent. So you can push a little bit of sand up into the lip of the bunker, but then make sure we're pulling down as kind of a finish. We don't want to be packing too much sand up into the lip or else that ball is going to bury in the lip 
and it's just not the way that the bunkers are designed to be played. There's even an etiquette to where to leave the rake when you're done raking the bunker. Some courses want you to leave it in the bunker, some courses want you to leave it half in, half out, some want it out of the bunker entirely. So check with the pro in the golf shop how they want that rake to be placed uh, when you're done raking the bunker and uh, your host will be most appreciative of your advanced etiquette. And when we're exiting the bunker, especially if it's a green side bunker, it's a nice little extra bit of etiquette to knock the sand off of your shoes in the bunker before walking up on the green. Last thing you want is to be leaving a trail of sand on the green because it's still on the bottom of your shoe. So just take that little extra moment, knock the sand off the bottom of your shoe and everybody will be happy. One of the things that I was kind of surprised to learn coming up in golf is that superintendents kind of prefer that the golf cart stays on the fairway versus the rough. The rough is meant to be a tall bit of grass and the more carts are driving in it and trampling it down, it's kind of makes it not quite as pretty. So try to limit the amount that you're driving in the rough in your golf cart when all possible. Uh, the rules of golf give us three minutes to find our golf ball. So if your ball's lost in the rough, just keep a little mental timer of three minutes, and if you don't find it, go ahead and toss the ball down. A lot of golf carts nowadays have GPS on them that keep you from driving in certain areas, maybe too close to a pond or something where you could damage the cart. So if you do get locked down in your cart in the rough, just throw it in reverse and back out of that area until your cart's unlocked, and uh, that'll keep you moving on pace. And generally, a little bit of swing advice out of the rough. We want to stand a little bit closer to the ball to get a bit steeper. You might want to take an extra club because there's going to be so much friction. The club is going to be rapidly decelerating in the rough, so we take an extra club and maybe open the club face up just a little bit when hitting out of the rough because that grass is going to tend to slam that face shut. Those three things should get you coming out of the rough with uh, relative ease. There's two different types of penalty areas. There's red penalty areas and yellow penalty areas. When you're in a red or a yellow, you can play it as it lies or take relief outside the penalty area for one penalty stroke. And remember, if one dimple is in the penalty area, your ball is in the penalty area. For either red or yellow penalty areas, you can play from where your last stroke was made. Think of that as stroke and distance or take back on the line relief by going back as far as you'd like on the line between the hole and where your ball last crossed the edge of the penalty area. In a red penalty area, you have one additional relief option, which is to take lateral relief within two club lengths of where your ball last crossed into the penalty area. That's no nearer the hole two club lengths laterally. If you decide to take a shot from within the penalty area, you can remove any detached natural or artificial objects known as loose impediments and movable obstructions. You can ground your club behind the ball and even take practice swings that touch the ground, but uh, you can't change your lie when you're doing any of this. You also can't deem your ball unplayable or take relief from abnormal course conditions such as a bridge or a sprinkler control box when your ball lies in a penalty area. You also are not allowed to play a provisional ball when you think your ball will be lost in a penalty area. What's a provisional ball? That's kind of an option for more serious play. If you think your ball might be lost outside of a penalty area or maybe out of bounds to save time, you can play an extra ball provisionally under penalty of stroke and distance. But before that stroke is made, you must announce that you're gonna play a provisional ball. You can play that ball up until you reach the point of your original ball without penalty. That just helps speed things up by playing a provisional ball. Just make sure to say, hey guys, I'm playing a provisional for a ball out of bounds. This is a Titleist three. The first one is a Titleist one. If you're stymied behind a tree, you can take what's called an unplayable. For a penalty of one stroke, you may take a lateral drop, two club links, no near the hole. Go back to where you played your last shot or go backwards in line with the pin as far as you want to go. You may hit your ball out of bounds. And remember, if just one dimple of your ball is in bounds, you are in bounds. There's a story about a mini tour player that didn't believe the rules official that his ball was out of bounds. So he told him to go get a string and they tied a string around the two OB stakes and pulled it tight and his ball was just barely in bounds. So 
it's a big saver of strokes if you can decide that even one dimple of your golf ball is in bounds. Hitting the ball out of bounds is really disastrous for your score because it's a stroke and distance penalty. That means you have to take both a one-shot penalty for hitting it out of bounds and you have to go back to where you hit the last one. So it's totally brutal. And uh, if you get up to your ball and find out that it's just barely out of bounds, there's a new local rule that you can take advantage of where it's a two-shot penalty where you get to just drop it in the fairway, no nearer the hole, kind of in line with where your ball was lost out of bounds. That just saves you from having to go back to the tee box and hitting it again. And uh, especially if you're spraying and praying, it can be uh, a, a huge relief to just take a two-shot penalty and drop it in the fairway and go on with your day. If your ball comes to rest in an area marked as ground under repair, you may either play your ball as it lies from the ground under repair or take free relief. To take relief, you must find the nearest point of complete relief from the ground under repair. That means your heels can't be touching the line. You gotta take complete relief from the ground under repair. And you're gonna take a drop within one club length, no near the hole, again, from the knee, Immovable obstructions are artificial objects which, though they may be present for a good reason, are not meant to interfere with your playing of the game. Immovable obstructions a golfer could encounter during a round include things permanently fixed in place like cart paths and sprinkler heads, as well as objects like divot and mix boxes that can be moved but only with a lot of effort, or if moved would cause damage or undue delay of play. You're entitled to relief without penalty from an immovable obstruction, like a drain, only when it directly interferes with at least one of the following. Your lie, area of intended stance, or area of intended swing. If you see someone really trying to bend the rules, they're gonna artificially widen their stance to come into contact with the sprinkler or something like that. So it has to be a reasonable stance, a reasonable swing, or a reasonable follow through that is gonna be impeded by that obstruction in order for you to get free relief. If we are entitled to free relief, we're just gonna find our nearest point of full relief plus one club length, no near the hole, dropping from knee height. And you might encounter loose impediments out on the golf course. Things like leaves or twigs can be moved without penalty but just be careful when you're moving that because if the ball moves when you're moving a twig, it's a penalty. So it becomes kind of like a little game of tiddlywinks. You gotta kind of have a surgeon's touch sometimes to remove the little leaves and twigs and rocks and things that are between your club face and the ball. Hopefully that was helpful. Those are some common on-course scenarios. And uh, I wish you luck in your next round of golf with your boss or a client. Here's my information if you'd like to come for a private lesson.